Well, I don't know where to start. That's a, that's a long question. I, I've been involved in the gem business since I was a boy. Uh, when our family emigrated from Australia, we uh, started in the opal business. My father brought opals over at the time in the um, uh, late 50s and uh, sold them and thought, this is fun. And that's how the business started. And as a boy, I was opal cutting and dealing in opals. And, and so that's how it started. Uh, but uh, in terms of a career, I uh, decided I became a mineral collector, and then in terms of a career, I uh, studied geology and became a geologist. But also kept my uh, passion and interest in gems, and took over the family business, which was in gems at the time, and expanded it into color stones and diamonds and jewelry. And uh, then I moved sort of on to work in with mining companies, uh, establishing, developing colored gemstone mining operations government contract work for diamond valuation. So I'm very much involved in gemstone mining, both diamonds and uh, colored stones. Oh, I was uh, involved in a, a number of projects. Uh, one of the uh, more significant ones might be uh, the uh, Emerald Mining Operation. We, I was involved again as the director of marketing for a, a company based uh, in Canada that was uh, investing money, uh, reconditioning and rehabilitating the Malashev Emerald Mine in the Urals. But uh, that uh, operation was successful and the mine was fully rehabilitated and back in full production, but because of a uh, dispute over licensing, unfortunately the uh, Canadian investors lost the uh, access to the mine. And uh, that would be one of uh, the bigger projects I worked on. I jokingly call it one of my more successful failures, but it's uh, beautiful stones. Uh, I've also worked uh, as in a consultancy basis with mining engineering firms on, um, on uh, operations in uh, Brazil, uh, Colombia, and uh, I've worked on diamond mines in Canada as a government diamond evaluator. A, uh, a gentleman had acquired a big chunk of uh, ground over the sapphire producing ground uh, in a land exchange agreement with the uh, uh, government or the Bureau of Land Management, so it turned it into private property. Prior to that, the only mining areas permitted were in the gullies, in the, in the, in the drainages of the hills, but the, everything between the hills was untouched and the top of the hill was untouched. So with the land exchange agreement and the private property, uh, uh, that gentleman wasn't interested in the sapphires primarily, he was interested in it for the timber. And uh, so that timber company, uh, over from the 1990s till early 2000s, uh, removed a huge amount of uh, timber and put in about 20 miles of roads all over the sapphire producing ground. And uh, so uh, uh, the gentleman who was uh, the owner of that timber company passed away and we had acquired uh, quickly, we were the first ones with the cash to acquire it uh, from the estate. And uh, now uh, we, and uh, so, so the ground had been turned into private property, which means we could access it and mine it so we acquired a uh, small miners exclusion permit that allowed us to uh, exploit the sapphires or take the sapphires in this ground that had been previously untouched. If anybody sees pictures of our mining operation, you'll see that we're up on the top of the hill. So these sapphires we're recovering are at the top of the mountain, not at the bottom of the mountain or not in the river valleys. It's a very interesting geology because no one quite is sure where the sapphires are coming from, in all honesty. I'm not aware that anybody's ever recovered any sapphires from the Rock Creek District in bedrock. All the sapphires recovered have been coming from the gullies or the weathered bedrock or weathered rock uh, on the top of the hill that blankets the entire hill in gravels and what geologists call debris flows or mass wastage flows, uh, which is not really like a river. The, the uh, gravels have not been um, processed and winnowed. It's very high energy, like a landslide, and these debris flows, um, we mine these debris flows to recover the sapphires which are suspended uh, in the, along with the clays and the waste rock. And um, so we're mining the debris flow or the gravels that are sitting on top of the hill. And uh, the gullies that were mined previously were uh, areas where it had secondarily concentrated the sapphires due to millions of years of weathering. Mining of sapphires, is uh, there's nothing magic about it. 
Uh, sapphires have a wonderful property in the fact that they have a density of 4.00. And uh, uh, they're a higher density, so when you process the gravels and let them settle according to densities, the sapphires tend to sit on the bottom of what are called jigs. And these jigs uh, vibrate uh, with water flowing over them. The light waste rocks flow away, the muddy water flows away, and then what's left behind is uh, the sapphires and other, and other heavy minerals, including magnetites and nails and bullets, because it's an, an <laughs> hunting ground, so we often find our sapphires mixed in with scrap iron, bullets, and, uh, and uh, garnets. And so uh, it's uh, based on heavy mineral processing. So that is nothing magical about that. It's been done through history. In fact, this deposit was discovered because prospectors were panning for gold and found these little pebbles, colorless pebbles and blue pebbles in the gold pans. In fact, I believe uh, the stones were found, I, I, I'm afraid the prospector's name escapes me, but it taken into a jeweler in, um, was it Phillipsburg or one of the other cities in Montana, and his, the jeweler's name was Whalen, so jeweler Whalen had declared the stones were sapphires. <laughs> and it's in the 1893 newspaper article. The ground uh, over the historically producing area of Rock Creek that we acquired was approximately 3,000 acres, and we acquired that in um, uh, 2014. We did have a uh, ground position uh, nearby, about uh, five, six kilometers away, in, a, in one of the gullies to the northeast called Eureka Gulch, which we had acquired in 2011. Uh, but that area was primarily uh, gold, so we were covering gold uh, nuggets and fine gold and occasional sapphires in that gully. Whereas the area we're producing from now in the West Fork of Rock Creek um, is uh, primarily sapphires with a minor gold component. It's definitely been producing. In fact, uh, we did our first uh, test pitting in uh, 2015, and uh, we recovered quite a few kilos of sapphire at that time. And uh, we uh, produced, uh, uh, both in 2016, 17, and 18, uh, more than 100 kilos each season of sapphire. And that sounds impressive, but it's not 100 kilos of big stones. It's 100 kilos of tiny stones, mid-sized stones, and a few big stones. And uh, uh, last summer, we uh, uh, commissioned a new processing facility, which uh, works on density separation. And uh, it's designed to do a, a larger throughput, so we can process more gravels uh, per day. And we also put in a gold recovery circuit, so uh, the gold is fine. There's not a lot of gold there, but it helps us uh, pay for the fuel and the trucking costs and uh, helps uh, pay a few uh, bills. And so the gold is a, is, a, is a very nice, what geologists call a sweetener. The vast majority of the sapphires we produce uh, are between three millimeters and under six, uh, sorry, f under five millimeters, between three and five millimeters. And then uh, the number of stones above that reduces substantially on an exponential curve. So that stones, uh, gr when I say millimeters, because we produce so many, we use sieves to sort them and not by weight. And uh, the uh, sapphires, well, I would say less than 1% of the sapphires are large stones that'll produce stones in the two to six carat range. And the bulk of the stones that would be produced would be in the uh, uh, half to, well, I would say 25 point to one carat range after, after cutting and polishing. And uh, the colors are quite unique. The uh, Rock Creek Sapphire Mine produces uh, really quite a broad range of pastels. Uh, the color that's most commonly seen um, is a, a teal or blue-green color, a very American blue color. Uh, if people are coming and wanting to buy Rock Creek sapphires that look like the cashmere or the top Ceylon stones, we do get a few like that, but by and large they don't look like that. And it's because the geology is quite unique, the geology of formation in um, Montana specifically Rock Creek, is uh, unique in the world. Um, the rubies that come out of Montana, they're there, and they're true rubies in the full sense of the word, um, and, but they're very rare. Uh, of 500 kilos in the last few years of production, I would say we've only recovered uh, less than a dozen rubies, and they're all stones in a, under half carat after cutting and polishing. So they're quite rare and a collector stone only, certainly not uh, of uh, substantive commercial interest. Uh, in the winter, one of the problems is snow. 
Um, so uh, uh, we have a seasonal mining operation. Um, we really start our mining season when the snow starts to melt. So we start moving our, our crews in and start getting things up and running late April. We're often in production by May, late, mid to late May. And uh, then we continue to produce until freeze up, uh, which could be late October, early November. So we generally only have about six months of production. So in terms of challenges, I would say the challenges are the weather. Um, uh, sometimes we can have a tremendous amount of water and we have more than enough water. Other times uh, our season is challenged with an absence of water. And absence of water uh, means risks of forest fires in the neighborhood. And when there's a forest fire in the neighborhood, uh, it may cause uh, us to be evacuated. So in 2018, we didn't have a forest fire problem, but 2017, we had to be evacuated several times because of threats of forest fires coming our direction. Um, other challenges are staffing. Um, and um, what other challenges would there be? Parts, getting parts in quickly is always a challenge. I tell people we're the largest sapphire producers in the Western Hemisphere, and uh, I challenge people to prove me wrong, and uh, they haven't so far. Uh, but of course, that brings with it a whole new set of challenges. A director of marketing, it's always easy to sell the rare, fine, large, rare stones. The challenge, of course, is to move the large volumes of mid-size and small stones. And uh, this creates uh, the need and the requirement for groups, jewelry manufacturing groups, that can move uh, substantive quantities of uh, stones um, in um, half carat to one and a half carat range. Most, uh, I would say, the bulk of our sales are domestic, uh, but we've also been exporting to uh, India, uh, uh, Thailand, Hong Kong, Sri Lanka, and Europe. Our objective, of course, is uh, to see if we can get some market entry in uh, China, and we're in discussions to see if that uh, market distribution can be established in China. We are a mining company. We're not uh, cutters, polishers, marketers, and distributors of finished jewelry or polished goods. So we have to work uh, uh, mutually uh, beneficial business arrangements with uh, companies that can do the cutting, polishing, and jewelry manufacturing, marketing, and distribution. By North American standards, it's an incredible amount of knowledge and buzz, I guess, is the best. Uh, and there's many more people have been hearing about it because more stones are out there. Social media means uh, that uh, information can get out across the world. And uh, my clients have uh, shared with me that they're selling their stones literally all over the world. Uh, I was surprised to hear that uh, one of our clients is selling many of his uh, stones in uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, England, Germany. Uh, these are both for single purchase stones and uh, small lots. Um, but needless to say, the bulk is uh, uh, Canada and the uh, United States, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and um, I've also been selling uh, goods uh, for a client who's uh, establishing a distribution network in Brazil where he'll be buying, hopefully buying rough and uh, cutting and polishing and distributing on the domestic markets in Brazil. All of these countries, uh, some have their own supply of sapphires, Australia does for instance. Uh, but the, the Rock Creek sapphires have a unique pastel, which is quite different than the Australian. So some people are looking for that unique color that they don't see in domestic productions. Or other countries don't have sapphire production, such as Europe. And uh, so they, they, they like what they see and they buy accordingly. Well, um, I'm sure they'll be coming in, it's only a matter of time. And of course, uh, as uh, producers, we don't mind providing as many control samples that any labs want anywhere in the world so they can have comfort level in the identification of the stones by inclusions or, or chemical analysis uh, or whatever other challenges are faced with the identity of origin. Um, it helps if you have a, a, a control database and we're prepared to provide samples to anybody who wants to do that control database. So I always point out that if our deposit was in a place like uh, one of the African countries, and I use Madagascar as an example because it happened recently. If we had this deposit in Madagascar, there'd be 50 or 60,000 people overrunning the hills and tearing them apart and destroying the forests. And, uh, 
because the D Department of Environmental Quality in, in um, Montana doesn't allow this to happen and we're under strict, uh, strict requirements for rehabilitation of ground, um, within a few years after we've worked an area, you don't see any evidence that it's been worked, especially in an area that's already been forested. Forestry companies are doing a lot more uh, uh, slash and burn than, <laughs> than mining companies. So we can disturb only five acres at a time. Uh, we're the only ones in the state of Montana that have uh, implemented uh, what's called a water clarifier. And it's a device that's about the same size as a school bus and costs us a lot of money. And uh, the mucky water comes in uh, from the processing facility and we have very clean water coming out the other side that looks like bottled water. And uh, it helps us, especially in times when water supply is a challenge, we, it allows us to recycle between 80 and 90 percent of our water. So we have to use very little makeup water. And it also keeps uh, all the uh, waste muck from going into ponds or into the local streams. Uh, we're in an, an area of Montana that uh, Rock Creek, although maybe known in the jewelry industry for a source of sapphires, is known by fishermen as some of the best trout fishing streams in America. And blue ribbon trout streams and bull trout are found in Rock Creek. And uh, so there's absolutely no way we want to have even the little even the least bit of murky water hitting Rock Creek.